I want to come back to the parents because your research has shown that some parents didn't go to the, didn't choose to go to the welcoming schools. There are other issues that they were concerned about. What did you learn from that research and what, what can we do to help parents going forward as they make these decisions in the future? Whether their school's closing or not, parents are going to have to decide and choose schools based on what's in their best interest. What, what supports can CPS and the community be offering those folks going forward? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. You know, I talk to people all over the country and oftentimes people express this view, oh, we should just close the poorly performing schools and then children can go to better performing schools. And I think what we've seen over and over again is it's really hard. I mean, it's really difficult. Um, there are a lot of barriers that families face and it's hard for you know, the school district to actually find schools and know that the students are gonna be successful there. You know, if we look in, at, in Chicago, you know, the district really took pains. I mean, they really thought, they looked at what's happened in the past, they really tried to get students into better performing schools, um, and most students were, you know, given a designated welcoming school that was much higher performing than their closed school, yet a lot of students didn't go to those schools. A lot of students ended up in schools that were just marginally better performing. And than that their was because schools. of some of the pressures. And that's that you because were there's about. so many barriers, right? Mm -hmm. It's you know we talk about having a school system of choice. Well, choice requires being able to get to different schools. You know, it requires having money for bus fare, being sure that you have a safe route for your child to go to different schools, being sure that you'll be able to pick your child up, being sure that the school is going to have the programs that are important to you. Um, if you have a student with, um, with disabilities, making sure that those programs are going to be there in the school that also meets all your other needs in terms of logistics, in terms of um, having the uh, quality academics. And you know, for parents, academics means a lot more than just having strong test scores. Um, and I think we all know that, and as parents and family members, we care about a lot more than So our yes, kids like give me some examples scores. of what's important other than just a basic yeah. test score. Well, of course, safety in the school, but also the degree to which parents feel like their children are going to get individual attention, very important for, for parents. And so for a lot of parents, they felt like their, their children were going to be moving from small schools into larger schools, where they were going to get less attention, they were going to be less likely to know people there. Um, and actually, there's a lot of research that says, you, you know, personal attention is really important for learning. Um, and children actually learn more when they get more individual attention. So it makes sense that parents want that. They want a place where their, their children are going to feel like they know other adults and also that they know other children. Um, you, know, and, you know, we have to recognize the fact that it's really, really hard to have strong schools in neighborhoods that are serving you know, a lot of families living in really difficult circumstances you need a lot more support um, for families and for school staff. And so until we really recognize mm. that, we're going to continually have this problem of not having a lot of schools that are in neighborhoods for, where parents can actually send their, their children that are actually very strong schools. Right. Jesse, I'd like to come back to you. Mm -hmm. what, what have you learned from this experience, especially picking up on some of the special needs of certain communities and certain uh, and, and certain groups of parents. What have you learned going, that you're going to apply at CPS going forward to address some of these concerns? Well, I think going forward, we're always constantly looking at what's the, the, all the services that go, what we sometimes call wraparound services that go into educating a child. Yes, a, a good performing school, but a lot of things go into making it a good performing school and then the surrounding community that supports that are there, the business community, the social service agencies, the nonprofit, the NGO community, there's a lot that goes into, and then not only, which is what factors we tried our best in looking at how to make a better situation for each and every child, and that was the guiding principle of, of making sure that public safety was there, and thus there's additional amount put into safe passage, five, over five million dollars, and thank God we've not had any incidents, and it's proven to, to be effective. The, the working with the police department to make sure, literally mapping out routes, literally mapping out uh, where students would get transported from, all those factors, the special needs of children and making sure that their needs were addressed. The ELL population of students, I mean, so many factors. I mean, it was a, a gargantuan task of doing this and thus nobody ever looks forward to doing it again. And making sure that we're, even going forward, we don't exacerbate this problem by, uh, you know, putting schools where, frankly, we don't need schools. And yet, addressing certain parts of the city where there's overcrowded schools. G2, did you want to make a comment? 
think um, what's, what we're not talking about is that there's a culture. No, just, just hold it up. Closer. Just hold it up. All right, excuse that better? Mm -hmm. All right. I think what we don't understand is there's a culture within Chicago public schools that has been anti-community, anti-parent, all the way down from parents who may disagree or challenge uh, the board being banned from their schools, children being targeted, all the way up to uh, parents and community not being listened to when we say what works in these schools. What's one of the most ignored resources, I believe, in the city of Chicago is the wealth of community-based organizations that are in this city. What are community-based organizations? These are folks who have made it their life's work to correct the, the, the issues and address issues in their neighborhood. These folks have deep relationships. They have examples of helping schools improve. Uh, Logan Square Neighborhood Association invented community schools. Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, powerful uh, community schools uh, organization. And are you saying that the, the CPS doesn't work with these community organizations? Does not work or listen to. Um, I can tell you, I've met with Mr. Ruiz around Diet High School. I showed him the data. In 2008 and 2009, we had the largest increase of students going to college in the whole district, in, the, in Chicago public schools. We had the largest decrease in arrests and suspensions, even though the school was set up to fail when it was created, because it was created when Kenwood Oakland was being gentrified, and they took King High School away from us to attract the, the gentry that was moving into the neighborhood. I hope you all are hearing me. So what happened as a result of that is they dumped those children into diet with as not, without as much as an honors class. I joined the LSC in 2003. I know what I'm talking about. And, when we, and so we had to organize. We had to pressure the district to give us honors and AP classes. They closed Inglewood. Arnie Duncan okay. closed Inglewood at the, the insistence of the community not to do it. De destabilized four high schools in the process. Increased violence at all four of those high schools. So it goes back to Asif's question. Who's held accountable for that? Because that's not bad parents. Mm -hmm. Those are not children that don't want to learn. Those are bad decisions. That it, that, and, and then the district doesn't have to live with those bad decisions. They don't have, and I'm not being emotional. They don't have to go to the funerals. They don't have to officiate the funerals. They don't have to try to find 21 and 22-year-olds who are maladjusted because they went to schools that were sabotaged and they're trying to get a job. You know, you're making a lot of allegations here, and you're, and you're, setting, and you're bringing up a lot of examples, and I'd like to let Jesse have a chance okay, so to respond, yes, respond generally. Yes, ma'am. Well, there is no mass conspiracy to, to, to you know, do anything harmful to any community. Obviously, the mission is to educate all our kids and so that they all pick it up. Well, believe it or not, that is the mission of CPS. And so there is no, and, and respectfully, I wasn't there in 2003, so I wasn't doing any of this. Um, and so there is no pattern and systemic, because it's a totally, by and large, a totally different group of people. And, and uh, you know. We're implementing the same program. Not implementing the same programs, because we, you know, there's now a five year moratorium on school closings. There's, you know, an office of public, uh, of, of community engagement that that family and community engagement that is actively working with organizations all the time. There's folks from all those organizations that I sit on, to, on Barbara's Latino Advisory Council. They're around the table with her. So, some of these same kind of community organizations that he's talking about are, are actively working with the CPS? The person, sure. The person yeah, who sure. directs the Office of Family and Community Engagement has personally made probably about $1.5 million up in the closed schools. So the person who directs that department has been the African-American face that's gone to schools and said, this is why your school is going to close. So he has not demonstrated a real understanding of family or community engagement. Okay. So I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. I'm not saying there are two people in a room. What I'm saying is the wrong people are making the decisions. So no, you were not at the board in 2003, but the same punitive approach to school improvement, when schools began to go on probation in 1995, which is set, because most times when schools go on probation, they stay on probation. So when schools go on probation, it is, a, it is basically preparation for them to, to, okay. to, to take these actions. Okay. I, so I wanna, that's the issue. I want to, we got to move this conversation forward because we're, we're mired in 2003 and 1995 and, and we've, and we've, this is a new day. I think we need to look at this as sort of a time to clean the slate and start over. And I want to, I want to ask, I want to bring Asif in. I want to bring, I want to bring, please respect. We will get a chance to bring you in in just a few minutes. I want to bring Asif back in here. Uh, having been, been through the experience of, of, of being in school that was closed, uh, talk about, again, not about the, the history, but about what you learned from that experience, what your colleagues learned that could be helpful 
uh, as we think about, and, and as, as you, you have a, a representative from the Board of Education right here, what does he need to hear about what the needs would be going forward? So I can sum that up real easy. I learned that the system was designed to do exactly what it was set up to do, and it's doing exactly that, and fail black and brown children. It's, it's, it's quite Okay, simple. so what do we do to, 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 to start to be, take responsibility for not failing black and brown children? Elected school board. Beyond the elected school board. Well, that, that's I, probably, as, as G2 said, that's not a panacea. That's probably just one solution. So Sure. So the elected school board becomes one solution, but also ensuring that this, this um, movement towards the valuing of the technocratic ideologies of teachers, the day-to-day -day BS that teachers are assessed on that actually neglects the strong relationships we build with children and communities. If you look back historically, and I hate to bring history, but it does matter. If you look back historically at teachers, particularly in CPS, they came from the communities in which they lived and they taught in those communities. So therefore they had deep caring relationships for those students and the community. So what, what is CPS doing to, to hold these sort of um, these aspects that, that make up a school, right? It's not just about performing well on a test or making sure you have the right amount of bodies in a the classroom. There are deep, more communal, caring um, issues of relationship and care and love that go into schooling, and we know this as history has accounted for. So I think we're, we're neglecting, again, I wanna go back to humanizing the young bodies that are inside our classroom spaces and that I used to teach and then I was forced out of being able to teach again. Okay, Elaine, uh, any research that, you, that you're aware of that, that shows how to make, how to, how to humanize, how to get away from sort of the, the building philosophy and the, and the and the sort of bureaucratic, how do you get at some of the, some of the issues that uh, Asif is talking about in terms of what can a CPS do to address some of those issues in terms of the research well, that you've done? there's a lot that you can do to build the community within a school and build relationships you know, from the school community out to the broader community. Is it on? It's, it's not picking up. It's underneath the sleeve, but it hopefully it should be on. Yeah. Hold it close to you. Hello? No. Lend it. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, I was just going to say that, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do to build a school and build a school community and make connections with the broader community. And we see that actually in schools throughout <coughs> CPS. Um, the district can do a lot to support schools and has done a lot in a number of different ways in terms of the priorities that they set, the time and the resources that they give to school staff to reach out to, um, to students, to families, to make time to plan, um, to make sure that they are monitoring students, um, reaching out to them whenever they, they show any kinds of needs, making sure students don't fall behind and they have time, they're sitting with students and, make, and their families and making plans for the future. The, the district has put in a number of initiatives to do that, data supports um, and also personnel. On the other hand, you know, there are also a lot of competing policies that make it difficult for schools and school personnel to take the time to see students as individuals. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on preparing for standardized tests. Um, there's a lot of time that's taken away um, from the classroom and from, and you know, honestly, there's not enough money in the school. So if we have class sizes of 35 students, mm -hmm. it's really hard for teachers to actually have the, the time to, um, to, that they really need with each individual student and to, to reach out with their, you know, and be partner with families like we should see.